my throat is recovering. So this is for my help as well. And, uh, but we definitely want to bless you here today. Our heart is to bless you, to share some things that God has shared with us, some things we learned the hard way, some things that we were taught by our family, and we still had to learn them the hard way, but hopefully you'll receive the blessing here today. Love, you want to say anything? Well, I just want to say thanks for having me up here, husband of mine. Uh, it's always, you are welcome. It's always a fun um, a privilege. Well, not a fun privilege. It's always a delight and a, and, a, and a huge privilege to be up here and to be speaking with you. And, and like Pastor was saying, we hope today you're going to lean in and I hope you grab your notepad. These are not earth shattering, just points and truths and principles we're going to teach. But I promise you, if you put them into practice, you will be blessed. So I see a couple of people moving to take some notes I hope a couple of you more will move and take some notes. Listen to me. Life, that, the life that we're living in today, the time that we're here on this earth, the enemy is not going to lay back and just let us take what the Lord has promised us. He is going to fight with everything that he can. But greater is he who is within us than he who is in this world. So we want you to be blessed. How many of you want to be blessed? Okay. Come on, I really want to know, do you want to be blessed today? Thank you. Thank you. So we started out this series uh, focusing on a, on a psalm that's dedicated to the family. Psalms 128 is dedicated to the family. And so Psalms 128 reads this way. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. That means take him seriously. And I'm going to share something with you. One thing that we have done done fairly well, and I pray that as we get older, we do it better and better and better. And notice, this isn't something that I plan to, to, to quit just because I become, I transition from this part of family life into grandpa part of family life. You go, not just yet, I know it's not just yet, but I'm looking toward the future saying, this doesn't end. I want to keep building a legacy, amen? Because some folks are saying, well, my kids are out of the house. What? It doesn't end. You get to keep building that legacy, keep pouring in the good stuff. So I feel like we've always taken the Lord seriously, and that came from my dad and my grandpa. So I want to remind you, you can teach your children to take the Lord seriously. That's what it means to fear him, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. I like that. That's good. Your your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the person or the man who fears the Lord. Amen. So real quick, all of these principles that we'll share with you today, these essentials, I want you to think of them in terms of a spiritual law by the name of sowing and reaping. There's a spiritual law in God's word that if you violate it, it's only to your detriment. But if you keep it, it's to a great blessing of yours. And it's found in Galatians. It's not the only place it's found, but I like the way Paul puts it to the Galatian people. He says, do not be deceived. Now, mark that first part of the verse. Deception will characterize the generations as we get closer to the end. Do you realize how much deception is in the world today? It's like you can't get people to tell you the truth on television, can you? That's why you got to go to YouTube or Google. They always tell the truth there. Uh, exactly. So deception will mark the end. And he says, do not be deceived. That means don't fool yourselves. God cannot be mocked. That means God will not be shown up. You won't prove God wrong. All you'll do is prove him right. This is what he says. For whatever a man or a person sows whatever you plant in the ground, that you will get up. So if you plant joy, guess what you get up? Joy. Do you realize that the good habits that you plant into your family soil, you get better at? See, a lot of folks have, have actually gotten used to planting some bad habits like critique, gripiness, grumpiness, you know, looking down at everything. But if you start planting the good stuff, believe me, you'll start getting a reward like that you won't be able to handle on your own. You'll have to share it with friends, family, and neighbors. Because the Bible says, 
in the same principle of sowing and reaping, Jesus gave a parable called the parable of the sower. When you plant good seed and it falls on good ground, you can get a 30, 60, 100% increase. Can you imagine getting an increase of joy, peace, love, harmony, closeness, unity? But you've got to be willing to plant it. So today, as we give you these seeds, I pray you go home, plant them on good soil. Amen? Amen. All right, number one. Here's the first one, guys. Write this down. Be hopeful and trust. Be hopeful and trust. And it's really about how we come into our relationships, the mindset, the view that we have of our family. If we are hopeful, if we trust the Lord for what he says that we can be, who we are, who our family is, then we will be blessed. But we have to hope in him and we have to put our trust in him. And sometimes, you know, can you, can we, I just be honest with you? Sometimes it's easier to believe good stuff for other people than it is for us to believe it about ourselves. Sometimes we think, wow, that's, that's great. That's great. That family's going to be blessed. Pastor's family's blessed. But my family, I'm not too sure. I want to share a verse with you. It's found in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Okay, I want you to underline that first part. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. You know, God only has good thoughts towards us. He's not up there sitting down thinking, wow, they have messed up. That family has done the worst thing. He is up there only wanting the best, thinking the best thoughts towards us. So when we have negative thoughts about ourselves, about our family, about where our family will be, we can say and we can No, right off the bat, that is not of God. That is from the enemy. And Mm. we can address Mm. the enemy and say, in Jesus' name, get out of my thought, get out of my heart, get out of my house, get out of my home, get off my property, get out of this place. Because only the Lord will rule and reign in my home and his thoughts are going to be to bless me. So we can be excited about that, right? We can be passionate about that because the enemy wants to trap us. He wants us to believe that we have somehow disqualified ourselves. Let me tell you something. There is nothing that you can do to disqualify yourself from what God has for you. As long as you trust him and you believe in him and you walk in his ways. The enemy wants to make you feel like, wow, I've done too much. I've sinned too much. I've hurt my family too much. We've hurt our, all of, you know, within our family, we've hurt the entire family, and there's nowhere we can go. God says that he wants to bless us, that he does not want the enemy to steal one more day. So if you've been allowing the enemy to steal from you today, don't allow him to steal from you anymore. Remember, God wants to bless you. He wants to, he wants to pour out a blessing upon your family. And nothing else that the enemy would love to do more is to disqualify you from the role that you have. I've been a bad dad, so I can't be a good dad. That is a lie from the enemy. God has you in that position, man of God, and he wants you to lead your family with boldness. Wow. So don't allow the enemy to tell you that you shouldn't be there or you've been a bad dad. Believe that God has you there for a purpose and a reason. I want to read to you Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. This is the trust part. And lean not on your own understanding, right? But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Look, I have a real quick story for you. Sometimes when we think that, um, you know, God's given us a dream. Anybody ever had a dream from the Lord? Anybody ever felt that the Lord wants to take you somewhere? Raise your hand if you have. Shown you something about your family that he has for you only to find yourself like, what's going on, God? This doesn't seem like the path that you've shown me we should be on. I want to remind you about somebody, Joseph. Joseph had a dream that was given from the Lord. And he knew that one day God had a great purpose on his life. But when we, he was in the midst of being sold into slavery by his own brothers mm. and thrown into a prison for a crime he didn't commit, he could have easily lost trust in the Lord, lost trust in the vision and the dream that the Lord had for him. But he continued to remain faithful. Families, that's what we have to do. Continue to remain faithful to trust the path that the Lord has from us. Because even though it may not seem like we're going where God has us, 
where he wanted us to go, he's working some things out. And we will be blessed if we stay the course on the path the Lord has for us. So trust and obey. That is so true. Trust and have hope. I just have one thing to share with you. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's the love chapter. At the very end of the love chapter, Paul says this, and now abideth faith, hope, and love. I want you to consider the progression. You don't love God right off the bat. You have faith in him. You trust him. You decide to put your faith in him and to accept his love. Hope then begins to stir and blossom in your heart, and it leads to love. And the greatest of these is love because we will live eternity in his love. But this is the thing. That bridge of hope is what the enemy wants to kill. Because if he can kill his, your hope, then you might have faith, but you'll never experience the fullness of God's love. You'll also always live in fear that somehow you're not good enough, that somehow you've messed up, you'll never make it up. And yes, you might, be, uh, you might not be where somebody else is, but then don't let him steal from you. We'll talk about this later by having you compare yourself constantly to others. What's for you is for you. That will set you free. And to say, Lord, you can make up ground like no one's business because you are an awesome God. And so I won't waste one more day worrying about what I did yesterday. I'm going I'm to focus on tomorrow. So it's as if you're driving down the road of life. You don't want to drive looking in the rearview mirror. That mirror is so small. Why? Because it's only meant to be glanced at. It's only meant to remind you, I don't want to do that again. And Lord, look at some good things you're already doing in my life. What I'm going to do is focus in the biggest piece of glass there in front of me, and that's the front windshield. I'm looking towards the future with hope, trusting in you. That's good, Pastor. That's good. Point number two, pray together. All I have to say about this is always be looking for an opportunity to pray with your family. Um, I think that some of our families here really excel at praying together, and there's some of us, I know because you've shared it with me, that you have a real difficult time praying, praying out loud, even praying with your spouse. And I would just encourage you in this, keep trying, keep praying together, That's keep right. looking. It doesn't have to be this huge, extravagant prayer. You know, the longer we pray, the harder we pray. It doesn't make God move anymore. He, he just, all we need to say is, Jesus, I need you. Simple prayers. Lord, help this situation out, Jesus, like only you can. Look for opportunities to pray together. The more you do that, the more you practice it, the better you're going to get at it. I can promise you that. And the Lord really, you know, for me as a, as a mom and just because of who I am, atmosphere is huge to me. How many of you have ever walked into a room and felt just a heaviness in the room? Like, no one can even be talking. No one can even have interacted with you, but there's just a heaviness. And, you know, we don't want our homes to feel that way. We want our homes to be just a, a place where God's presence is Absolutely. felt in a scene, and the Lord is always welcome. He always has a place of honor in our homes. And what we do when we pray together, when two or three touch, God's very presence is there. We, mm. we bring his presence. We invite his presence into our home, into that situation. And so for me, praying is, is huge. I'm always with my girls. I'm like, they share something with me. I'm like, okay, let's pray right now. Um, with my son, let's pray right now. Because that, that's where we really draw in the Lord. And I want to encourage you in, um, in Philippians 4.8. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Can we all say that? But in everything. everything. Come on. By prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. You know, God knows our hearts. He knows our needs. He knows our desires. Why don't we just be honest with him and share them? Mm. It, it's so much more beneficial for us when we get to just say, Lord, I'm going to pray and I'm going to just trust you in it. I'm going to lay it at your feet. And, you know, just standing on that principle again in Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Again, I say to you, if two or three agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. I don't know about you, but that is an amazing scripture. 
Come on, that gives us the peace where we don't have to worry about it. When we pray and we agree and we it's ask done. of the Lord, it's done. It's a yes and amen. Book closed. I can go forward. I don't have to lose sleep. I don't have to waste time thinking about it. God has got it. And God has got it, like I always say, better than I could have ever dreamed for, hoped for, imagined, right? Because that's what his word says. I, there's not much I can say. The, she covered that. All I can encourage you to do from the guy's point of view, some of my guys, I know your heart. You want to pray, but you don't feel comfortable. You're not going to feel comfortable unless you get out there. Just start praying. And can I tell you, this will set your prayers free. Prayer is not about being eloquent. Prayer about, is not about any of that. Prayer is about just talking from your heart. Yeah. Just talk from your heart. God will listen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, Next point, uh, number three, right? On number three? Yes. yes. Seek out wise, mature families. Seek out wise, mature families. This is a point that I see often, very often, uh, families don't live by. And, and I just want to remind you, I want to remind you how important it is to have good folks around you. It's going to be hard to soar with eagles if you run with turkeys. That's just, that's just the way it is. I can remember my mom used to tell me that. Son, you, I know you want to soar with eagles, but it's hard when you're running with turkeys. And it's important, just the way we measure our friends, our kids' friends, you got to measure your friends. And so you have to ask yourself hard questions. Do these friends bring me closer to God? Do I feel more inspired? Do I feel passionate about God's house? Are they encouraging me to be all that God has called me to be? Or are they bringing me discouragement? Do I not even think about God? Do I find myself being less passionate about the things of God? Because those friends are not good ones. I'm just going to share with you. If you want to have a great family, you've got to have great families to be around. And those great families will want you to, uh, to be all that God has called you to be. And you'll find yourself experiencing more joy. You'll find yourself being more patient with each other. You'll find yourself treating your children better. You'll find, they'll just be improving you. And so I want to remind you of something that I learned in discipleship with a young man that came to me and he had a laundry list for what he wanted to pr me to pray for his next, or his, yeah, his, his next bride. Spouse. It was his next bride. Uh, and so he'd already, he'd already been through one, one bad situation. Um, and he said to me, this is the list. And I go, wow, that is a tall order. Like this list is next level. And then I realized, um, as I prayed, you don't meet up to this. Meaning you want a superwoman, but you're not Superman. You're down here praying for up here. Can I share something with you? If you're a family that wants to hang out with great families, you're going to have to start being a great family because great families aren't going to want to hang out with fa other families that aren't living by his word. Yeah. But that's the good thing. When you live by his word and you start getting into the circles with other great families, then your family improves and improves and improves. And that's called discipleship. If you're not in discipleship, won't you join? We've got a great one on Monday night, Brother... Uh, Brother Phillips here, raise your hand, Steve. Monday nights, they're going through Genesis. We've got uh, Tuesday nights. We've got Thursday night. Brother Chris in the back, raise your hand, Chris. For all my men, I want you in discipleship. That's how you get a great family. You start hanging out with other great families. Amen. Amen. One, one last thing I want to say about that, sure. Pastor, because I feel like it's really important. I know what you might be saying. Well, yeah, now I'm saved. Now my family's saved. We're walking in the right direction. We want to influence those bad friends or those, you know, friends that we have that weren't living for the Lord. We want to help them come to know Jesus. Well, you got to be careful because you need to make sure you mature enough. You need to make sure those strongholds that you had in your life that sometimes those friends um, will bring you down and pull you down in, that they're still not strongholds. Because you have to be aware of how mature you are in the Lord before you walk into those same environments and spend time with them. You may think, wow, I'm going to influence them. I'm going to change them. I'm going to share Christ with them. But they could be very quickly influencing you back towards the things that pulled you away from the Lord. So make sure. I think Paul said it best. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be misled. 
Bad company will corrupt good character. That's good. We like to think that's just for us, the kids, but that's for us too, right, parents? Come on, let's be honest. All right, point number four, speak life. You know, speak life. It's not only important to have the right thoughts, the right mindset. We have to be mindful of the words that are coming out of our mouth. They have the power to give life or death. In fact, in Proverbs 18, 21, it says the tongue has a power of life and death. You know, it is the strongest muscle that we have in our bodies because what we, how we use it can really change the course of our family. If we're life, if we're speaking life giving words, if I'm speaking just encouragement over my husband. If I'm saying, man, babe, you look good today. I love you. You brought it the word today. You know, I appreciate you're a good provider. I appreciate you're a good husband. Well, how do you think he's going to treat me, ladies? What do you think he's going to give me in return? It's the same principle that sowing and reaping. Of course, the words that we speak, what we say, how we, you know, declare our spouses and our children's goodness over their lives, they're going to learn to receive that, and they're going to give it back to us as well. So we need to speak words that are life-giving, words yeah. that are powerful. And the best words that we can speak are, is God's word because it truly is life-giving. It really can change the course of our families. Amen. Think about it this way. The Bible says that he upholds this entire creation by his word. By the power of his word. Now, I want you to think about this. That same creator breathed into us. And this is the breath that he gave us that we speak words. Now, granted, our words are not his words. But what if we line our words with his words? What if, what if our words are what he spoke? And we shower our families with that, with that life-giving word breath, those words. That's very, very important. As a, as a father, I have to remind myself, because I get frustrated. Come on, how many of us get frustrated sometimes in the home? And we start ranting, raving, kind of getting on it. And then I have to remind myself, okay, how can I be positive? Because every good coach knows that if you're going to bring the best out of your team, you've got to speak two to one. Encouragement to rebuke. Encouragement to, um, you know, setting things right. Or being critical. That's the word I'm looking for. Being critical. So you have to have two good things for every critical thing you say. And that's, and that's on the very bare bones minimum. It's actually better if you go three or four to one. So this is really, really important. And, uh, and then sometimes you got to even be careful the way you, you, you joke. Because like sometimes some of us are sarcastic or we're, we can be a little funny. But... It depends on how they take it. But we have to build each other up. I know I have to build Melissa up according to what she likes and what she wants. And she's always worrying about looking a certain way and being. Let's be honest, okay? I, we've had a good summer. We've had a I've good summer. I've been eating more than I should be. And I stepped on the scale, ladies, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to lose some weight, babe. we got to start working out. Come on, we, we're all there, right? We've all been there. If you're not there now, you will be at one point. <laughs> but my husband is an encourager. That's I'm an just, encourager. That's I who just he started is. loving you know, her. He just and started her. loving her. Like, babe, you look good. Don't worry about it. Come on, you're beautiful. You know, he started telling me this. And, and I was like, thanks, babe. And he's like, you know, it's like, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my wife all over my wife. And I couldn't help but laugh. He's like, no, you've got so much of God's goodness. It's just showing on you. So, you know, and he was being funny and silly. But now every time I hear that song, I just laugh inside of my heart because I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter how small or how big I get. My husband loves me for who I am. I know that to be true. So, Thanks, love. <laughs> we do. We want to encourage each other. We want to be for one another. We want to celebrate each other, not just tolerate each other. And then that leads us to our next point, and that's complete, don't compete. This is really, really important, guys, because when a couple starts competing, it influences the entire home. And competition is about making sure you're up ahead of the other person. Yeah. And so when you start getting that attitude, you want the other person to be, what, put down or fall behind. 
instead of understanding, hey, we're not here to compete on each other. We're, we're here to uplift one another. So I don't have to zing her to make myself look better. I don't have to remind her of her shortcomings so that the kids and everybody else will know that I'm winning. Because that's not true winning. All it does is breeds this competition that spills on over to our children. And then it makes it very unpleasant to even spend time with one another because we're always competing and always trying to one-up each other and always trying to remind each other how I'm better at this and I'm better at that and I do this better than you and you're not as good here. And that right there will steal real closeness and affection from your home. You're there to complete one another, not compete. So therefore, you celebrate each other's uh, strengths and you look at each other like I'm there when Melissa is weak, I'm there to be strong. When, when I'm weak, she's there to be strong. She's better at a lot of things that I'm weak at, and I appreciate that. Which leads us to our second point, and that is? Admire, don't compare. You know, admire, don't compare. This is, this is something that can really take us off course of who God has for us as a family. You know, Pastor already said it. What's for, what's for me is for me. What's for you is for you. God is big enough to bless us both in the process of that. Sometimes we think God only has so much goodness, and if he gives that other family or uh, even within our family, our spouse so much, then he doesn't, he, he doesn't have an allotment for us. That is so not true. You know, comparison really is what still our joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. So we need to remember to not be looking over and saying like, wow, look at that family. Look how much they've accomplished. Look at their children. Look at them succeeding. Why can't we be more like them? Why, you know, and you start to like feel frustrated with your spouse and with one another. And the truth of the matter is God created all of our families differently. We all have great, you know, family dynamics, great family DNA and culture within itself. So we need to learn to celebrate it and not be looking outward because the minute we start to look outward it takes us away from the focus of what God wants us to do within our own family you know it's okay to admire qualities that people have that families possess yeah. but it should not be what we are focusing on because when we start to do that it's basically saying like God I appreciate you, but really you did not do enough, especially women. Social media, we compare other women. We look at what other people are doing, how we should look, how we should dress. That is, that's so unfair. What we need to do in that moment is we need to say, look, God, I appreciate you. You made me beautiful. You are, you know, you uniquely created me. Um, and be grateful for what Amen. God has given us. I, I want to I jump in here. Social media is like wrecking families all over the place. Do you know that? Because people will get on social media and, and be a completely fake family. Yeah. And others will sit and envy them. Listen to what the Bible says about this. The Bible says in the book of James, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil practice. No, not just evil practice, every evil practice. Listen to what Proverbs says. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. But jealousy, if you go to another version, if you go to the uh, NIV, it says envy is like cancer in the bones. And can I tell you, God showed us a very, very interesting lesson early on in our marriage um, I can remember one day, one of us was looking at social media, and let's just say I don't look at social media, so we'll, but one of us was, um, and uh, one of us started saying, I wish you could be like their spouse. They seem to be so attentive and so wonderful and so great, and I said, yeah, he's probably gay. Um, no, I'm just kidding. That's what I say about it. Every guy that's great, you know, but anyway. Um, why did I say that? That's like, I just, I just, <laughs> that's like, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, ruin the recording. We'll have to work on that recording. Um, but no, I said, there's got to be something wrong there. <laughs> and of course, I was just trying to take the pressure off of me. Come to find out he'd been having a three-year affair. And uh, I only say that not to impress you and us, but to impress upon you. It's something that God highlighted for us early on. People can act any which way they want. 
And when you start comparing yourself to them, you may not be comparing to the right thing. Be who God has called you to be based on this word. The truth is, the truth is I needed to be more attentive, but not because I was comparing myself to this guy or that guy. I needed to be more attentive because God's word tells me to love my wife as Christ has loved the church. But then she needed to remember that um, things aren't always what they seem. Amen. And things have always been what they seem for us either, you know, but we try very hard and we're not up here as experts. We're up here as humble servants saying, Lord, can we be a blessing to your church? And that, that's our heart. Do you want to say anything else about comparison since I kind of blew it up there? No, Pastor, that was Sorry. good. We, we'll leave it right there. <laughs> um, How about excel in our purpose? Excelling in our purpose. Okay, this is something that I am extremely passionate and excited about, excelling in our purpose. You know, sometimes we... Um, we forget because we start getting distracted in all sorts of uh, places and the wrong things, that we have a purpose, that God has placed us here on this earth right now in this point in history, and that we have all been given a certain amount of time, of treasure, and of talent in it. We, how are we using it? Come on, what are the things that we are investing in? I mean, it is not about positions. It's not about prestige. It's about the kingdom purpose. And I think if we could really get this deep within us, then we could get excited and passionate, and we could start looking at one another's families like, come on, what are you doing for the kingdom? What are you doing for the kingdom? How can we encourage you? Because we are, we are God's children, and our purpose here is to help share Christ with other people, and I think, because I see you guys, and, and this summer, I'm going to be honest with you, Driven by Eternity it was so eye-opening for so many of you women who were in discipleship, because it's all about God's kingdom purpose, and how However God has uniquely created us, he's put us here to fulfill that purpose, whether it's Amen. in a business setting, whether it's in a school setting, whether it's a mom at home. We have all got to be, come on, awakened to the fact that God has a purpose for our lives. You know, for too long, I should have known this because God miraculously healed me when I was two years old. I should have known the, that the, um, the devil really wanted to take me out. Mm. The devil wanted to take me out. And I should have been aware even growing up, but I, and I was, but then I lost sight of that. And this past year has been one of the most challenging years that I've had. And I've, and I've made a determination. I'm like, you know what, God, the devil wants to take me out. He wants to take me out because I can't be the mom I'm called to be. I can't be the wife I'm called to be. I can't be the pastor I'm called to be. And I'm not going to waste any more time with that. Devil, get behind me. I'm looking forward because I've got a purpose to fulfill. I'm not going to waste one more minute. Yes. I'm not going to waste one more second. I'm going to get passionate about telling people, you need to be passionate about your Lord and Savior. And don't just hold that goodness for yourself, but share it with somebody else because this is eternity we're talking about. Lives can be changed if you just put yourself in a position to say, you know what? I'm not going to put it on someone else. I'm going to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. Amen. Amen. You know what, guys? Having a purpose mindset and being kingdom-minded will change the way your family interacts. Because what I've seen in families, a lot of times they get this competitive streak. They get this comparing um, temptation. And they start to compare and compete. And the next thing that's, that, that bleeds over to the children, then the children start having their own families. And they're always trying to one-up and size each other up. But when they have a kingdom mindset, then they realize it's not, it doesn't matter if one has a, a beach house or a boat or a, or a condo here or a mountain home or has a high-paying job while somebody serves others and, and, and does something more in public service. None of that matters. What matters is how they focus on the kingdom of their heavenly father and expanding the kingdom for his glory. And it doesn't matter how much you have or how little bit you have. We all have gifts and skills that we're either bringing to bear for the glory of God to make his name famous or we're not. But when a family learns to excel in that, then they highlight that in each other and they celebrate that in each other and they talk about that and they help each other in advancing the kingdom. And whether they're short or tall, big or small, 
they all put their hand to the plow and they push forward to accomplish the goal of expanding the kingdom of God. And that makes for great conversation. That makes for great unity. That just does something in the heart of a family. And so I also want to say something about kingdom. We made a determination early on that we would not raise our children like the world insisted we raised them. We made a decision early on to homeschool our children. Um, may not be for everyone. And my family, full of educators. My mom worked for the school district. She retired as a uh, bilingual coordinator. You know, my, my brother is a superintendent. You know, we have, but we knew that it was our responsibility to make sure our children were raised with certain values. And I wasn't going to leave that to chance. Now, you might say, well, pastor, I'm doing a good job. And, we, and that's fine. I don't judge anyone for that. I just want to let you know that sometimes you're going to have to march against the current or against the grain. You're not going to have it. You know, people are asking me, what about university? I don't know if that's the best thing to send my children off to university in such pivotal, pivotal formidable years. I want to make sure that I'm still influencing them, that they still get a good Christian grounding in their faith. Yeah. I also know that for me, the most important thing is not that my children go out and get a high-powered job, that move halfway across the country, be chasing the mighty dollar all over the world in Southeast Asia or wherever different companies might send them. To me and to them, hopefully, is this kingdom, the kingdom of God of Almighty God. Now, if God sends them halfway around the world to Southeast Asia to share the gospel, God, praise the Lord. But I also want to see them doing something for the kingdom. While most parents highlight that they be doctors, lawyers, something famous, something great, I'd love the, the next pastor to rock the world. You know, I'd love them to be the next Apostle Paul, the next Apostle Peter. That's what I'm hoping my children will be. So that, that, that gives you a perspective on how we approach uh, family life. And I pray that, that it would bless you in that. Last but not least, we want to talk about making memories and living life to the fullest. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might live it to the fullest. And that means... We've got to learn how to be passionate and how to get out there and really be grateful for this life God has given us. Learn to have fun with one another. You know, good businessmen and good team leaders always know that, that teams need memories. You need to make memories together. You need to have something you can celebrate together. Well, guess what? There's no greater team on the face of the earth than God's family and God's church. And so be a family that celebrates together, wins together, and makes memories together. That means you're going to have to get out, of, get out into the sunshine. You're going to have to take some risks. I can remember, and you guys know the story, of us going to Belize and almost, uh, almost losing our little one, making a memory. But she's here. She's here. That's all that matters. She survived. And, uh, and we got her to the hospital, and they stitched her up, and it was great. But now we talk about that with such fondness, and we laugh, and we have a good time. And we remember how mom freaked out and ran down the mountain before everybody and put her hand on a black palm, and we just laugh out loud. Remember when mom, we just, she had already run ahead of us. And what do we say, Raquel? She touched that black palm, and we just heard her scream, ah! But we make great memory. Some of you are going, what are you talking about? That's not cool. We also have small memories, like getting out in our backyard and spending time gardening together, going to grandpa's house, going to grandma's house, going and visiting cousins, and going and having a good time skiing and learning new things. Or how about going to the Royal Gorge for the very first time? How many of you have ever been to the Royal Gorge? If you have it, you should go. Go make a great memory with your family and then zip line across. And dads, don't be too cheap. 
because when they told me how much, I'm like, really? And then my son goes, you only live once. Let's make a memory. And I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. And so we It was kind of scary, you know, when you got to sign the waiver, like, this could happen. This could happen. Potentially, you could. Those are the best memories when you life. have to sign waivers. So that's Honey and Evie. That's Honey and Evie coming down over the Royal Gorge right there. It was so beautiful, so breathtaking, and it's something that our family will always remember, and we laugh, and we look at it, and you can see just joy in our kids' eyes. And I just want you to notice, ladies, um, that's me on the right, and that's Pastor on the left. Both Evelyn and I, we had our hands wide open, and the guys were holding on, but us girls, we're pretty brave, right? <laughs> it's another memory. I heard my dad saying, man, look at that. Those, those girls are brave. Um, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. You know, we've got gorgeous families here. I hope y'all enjoy just some of these insights and essentials to helping your family grow and thrive. And we are believing God's best for you. You know, we know that God has great things in store for our families. And if you need help or if you're struggling with your purpose, come talk to us. We'd love to help you in that. We want to walk with you. If you're saying, man, I really need someone to invest in my family, that's what discipleship is all about. It would be our privilege to disciple you, to help you take that next step in your walk with the Lord. And, you know, God has this church being set and put into place because People in this community are noticing our families are blessed. So Amen. I want to say, I want to encourage you, take these principles and put them into practice in your family. But when you have opportunities to impact other families, when you have opportunities to encourage other families, make sure you make the most of it and share those principles with them as well. Because this church is becoming known in this community as well. If I want to bless family, that's where I'm going to go. And so we're going to pray a blessing over you today as your pastors. I want to encourage you um, just to uh, stand up right now in this moment. Right after this, pastor will lead us in communion. But grab your family if you're next to them. I'm going to encourage you to open your hands, one hand um, around your family, and the other hand open it to the Lord this morning so we can just pour out a blessing upon you. Lord God, we just pray for the families in this house, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, because you are all about families, Lord. And Lord, as we extend our hands towards them, Father, we know that it is your greatest favor and blessing that is covering them, Father. Lord, we thank you because you go before us, behind us, beside us, Lord. You are within us, Jesus. Lord, I thank you because, Lord, you are setting our families on a course, Lord, that is so much bigger than what we are just seeing in the here and now. You are setting us on a purpose that has eternal significance, Jesus. Father, I thank you because we have harmony and unity in our family, that we are for one another, that we are encouragers, that we are people who believe the very best for each other, Lord. Lord, thank you for your amazing love, God. Thank you for blessing us with children and grandchildren. Thank you for us for, um, thank you for allowing us, Lord, just to be here today and to worship you, God. God. And today, Lord, I pray that we leave encouraged and excited and that we go out and look for ways this week to have memories and make memories and just celebrate how good you are and how you've been to us. But more important, Lord, help us always be grateful, Lord. Help us always be grateful. Thank you that your face is shining down upon us this morning. In Jesus' name we say amen and amen. Amen, amen. Guys, I joke about the best memories are the ones that... Uh, you know, you have to sign a waiver to go do, yeah, ha, ha, yeah, that's awesome. Um, no, the best memories that I have of my father and grandfather and my grandmother and my mother of them praising the Lord, lifting their hands, singing with all their heart, praying for their family. May, be, may that be the memories you make that will last through the ages in your children's minds, the legacy of a father and mother loving Jesus with all their heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of life on the cross. We know, Lord, that you willingly shed your blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and you allowed your body to be broken so that we might be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Church, we love you. Have a great, great week.